Welcome everyone to the next IITE seminar today. And it is my pleasure to introduce Christy Hernandez, who's going to be talking to us about a new take on live table response experiments. So without further ado, Christy, please, the floor is yours. Thanks. Um, yeah, thank you so much for this opportunity to talk about some of the work I've been doing as a postdoc at Cornell. Uh, I've been working with this fantastic group of collaborators that you see on the screen and who I think you've heard from before in this series. Um, there we go. Okay. Um, I want to just highlight that this work was published recently in Methods in Ecology and Evolution. The paper covers the methods I'll be talking about today, the error meta-analysis I'm going to talk about, and also some um, more details on the R package and lots more details on the math, the math. underpinning what I'm talking about today. So um, go read it if you're interested in more. To get us all on the same page before I get into talking about life table response experiments, I want to talk a little bit about structured population models, which I consider really crucial for demographic research. Structured population models, what I'm talking about is um, a model where we've collected data on individuals and we group them into classes. So those could be age, size, or developmental stage that really helps us understand the, or, or that really affects the vital rates that those individuals experience. So those can vary from quite simple models that are age classified and leads to a relatively sparse matrix like a Leslie matrix or something more complicated like this model for common teasel where individuals can move back and forth between reproductive and non-reproductive phases. Uh, they grow um, between multiple size groups um, and the reproductive individuals can produce multiple types of offspring. The other thing that I want to highlight about these kinds of models, so in particular, I'm talking about matrix population models and integral projection models, is that they are discrete time models. So the classes should be selected such that the time step of the model uh, aligns well with the transitions among those states and also aligns well with the life history of the species. So we have a population vector that contains the number of individuals in each of those classes at time t. It's multiplied by a projection matrix to generate a population vector at time t plus one. And here I've written the projection matrix in the most simple terms possible, basically. Um, I'm showing the first row as being fertility uh, parameters, and then the rest of the matrix um, can is quite generally referred to with transition probabilities um, or transition rates. So these are the um, transitions between the different uh, population classes. Um, this can include growth, survival, retrogression, and also reproduction. And all of the entries in these projection matrices are zero or positive numbers. So to move into life table response experiments more specifically, the conditions that a population experiences, be that the treatment, location, or time period wherein the data was collected, uh, influence the elements of the projection matrix A. And then the entries of that matrix A determine the population growth rate. So when we're talking about lambda, we're talking about the leading eigenvalue of that projection matrix. And a life table response experiment decomposes the difference or variance in lambda amongst multiple populations into the contributions from the matrix elements and their interactions. So how do the changes in those conditions cause changes in vital rates that cause changes in the matrix and, and the um, population growth rate. And just to note, um, this can be done on any summary metric that you can calculate from A. So if you're more interested in generation time or net reproductive output, um, you can just replace lambda throughout all of my slides with your metric of interest. Um, and also this can be performed on lower level vital rates as well. So I'm gonna be focusing on talking about matrix elements, and that's what the code and the paper have focused on so far, but um, you can do this on lower level vital rates as well. 
To underscore why LTREs are so important, I'm going to talk through an example. So this was published in 2001 and is work done on ground squirrels. So there were two populations. Uh, this was a field manipulation, so uh, a field experiment. They collected data on two populations, uh, subjected to different conditions, built matrix population models from those, and these were age classified. And they found that the difference in fertility and survival was largest in these oldest age classes. So if you looked only at this, you might think, wow, there's really big differences in those old age classes. That must be what really matters for causing the difference in population growth rate. But because the LTRE takes into account both the difference in those vital rates and the sensitivity of lambda, which is a nonlinear function of those vital rates, we actually see that the early life parameters, the early life fertility and survival have much larger contributions to the difference in lambda than these later life parameters, despite having much smaller observed differences in those vital rates. So that's why these LTREs can be really important for interpreting what's going on with these populations because um, they take into account both the observed differences and the sensitivities. So we've focused so far on two types of LTRE. The first is fixed design, which decomposes the difference in lambda between two populations. That's like the example I just talked through. And then the second one is random design LTRE, which decomposes the variance in lambda across a set of populations. And I absolutely want to give credit to Hal Caswell, um, who introduced these methods into ecology um, in important papers in 1989 and 1996. So I'm going to talk you through these um, methods introduced by Hal that we refer to as classical LTRE. So for a fixed design LTRE, the difference in lambda um, between two populations is decomposed according to this sum. So AIJ are the entries of the pro projection matrices for a treatment population M and a reference population R. That's multiplied by the sensitivity, which is the derivative of lambda with respect to those matrix entries. And that's evaluated at the mean matrix. Uh, that's the standard recommendation. And there are good mathematical reasons um, to uh, evaluate these sensitivities at the mean matrix. We can talk more about that in the discussion later um, if you want. But yeah, it the sensitivities are evaluated at this linear mean of the two of the treatment and reference population matrices. So each term in this sum up at the top is referred to as contribution, and those are the main effects of each matrix entry, and no interaction terms are computed in this method. In random design uh, LTRE, uh, we decompose the variance in lambda into contributions which come from the variance covariance matrix. So capital C I J K L is the covariance of the I J entry and K L entry of the population matrices across all the matrices in the set. Um, and we multiply that again by the sensitivities evaluated at the mean matrix. And this approximation includes main effects. So the terms from the diagonal of the variance covariance matrix um, and the second order interactions, which are those off diagonal terms from variance covariance matrix. So this method has been in use in ecology for a few decades now. It's, um, you could call it a relatively mature analysis. Uh, why do we need exact LTRE? What is our motivation for uh, updating these methods? The first is that the computed terms are approximations based on multivariate Taylor series expansion of lambda as a function of the matrix entries. Um, that's all I'm going to say about that for now, but we can definitely discuss that more uh, later. The second reason is that the classical methods perform a limited decomposition, and I've started to kind of allude to this a little bit. So a fixed design LTRE includes only main effects. And then the random design LTRE includes both main effects and two-way interaction terms. Because lambda is such a nonlinear function of many, many variables, uh, those higher order interaction terms exist. There's many of them, and we don't really know how important they are 
from simply using these this approach. So with that motivation in mind, being able to quantify some of these interaction terms and being able to calculate the, the terms in a more exact way without relying on approximations, we're using a framework called EFANOVA. So I'm going to give you a bit of background on EFANOVA before we go into the specifics of how it applies to exact LTRE. So given a nonlinear response function f, that's a function of many variables, we would like to express f as a sum of main effects and interactions. For example, following this equation shown here, there's a baseline or overall mean term, there's main effects of each variable, two-way interactions, et cetera, all the way up to the d-way interactions. Functional analysis of variance, or FANOVA, is an umbrella term for several different ways of doing just that, expressing that response as a sum of these different interaction terms. Um, and it's useful for several different purposes. So one flavor of FANOVA leads to model sensitivity analysis using Sobel indices. Um, this approach assumes input variables are drawn independently from probability distributions. And I mention it here because you might be familiar with it. And I just wanna note that that's, that's not what we're doing. Um, but that does also derive from FANOVA. The flavor of FANOVA that we're focused on um, deals with the sensitivity <clears throat> of a response F to the presence or absence of some feature, so mechanism or process. Each input variable XI is represented with either a, uh, takes the value one or zero, which indicates the presence or absence of some feature. F of the whole set of variables is the response to a particular combination of features being present or absent. The baseline is defined as the response when all the features are absent. And then the main effects and the interactions measure deviations from the baseline. So here it is in a two-factor case. The baseline F0 is the response function F uh, when both uh, features are absent. The effect of feature one is the response when feature one is present and feature two is absent minus that baseline term, likewise for feature two. And then the interaction term is the response when both features are present minus the baseline. And we also have to subtract out the main effects. So the interaction is the effect of both things being present above and beyond the sum of their main effects and so on. So we keep doing this for more factors and higher order interaction terms. Um, and when this, when the response is noise-free, all the main effects and interactions of all orders are computed exactly. We apply this same methodology to build an exact version of LTRE. In our case, the response is the difference or variance in lambda when matrix elements are allowed to vary or are not allowed to vary between and among populations. The features are those matrix elements, whether they vary or not between populations. Um, and the effects are then, uh, I'm gonna show you how they get calculated. Um, one other thing I want to note before I walk you through an example um, is that in exact LTRE, our baseline term is always equal to zero because if none of the matrix elements vary between or among populations, then the difference in lambda or the variance in lambda is always zero. Um, so I won't be talking about that F subscript zero effect. Um, there's, there's no baseline response in these, in these cases. So let's talk through an exact LTRE for a simple two-stage model. In this model, we have juveniles that mature to adults at a rate J, adults that survive at a rate A, and then adults produce new juveniles at a rate F. And this is our discrete time model for this population. We can imagine that we have a control population and a population exposed to a pollutant. Based on data collected in a laboratory experiment, we build population models for the control population and the pollutant exposed population this pollutant has a negative effect on all of the population vital rates. The juvenile survival, adult survival, and adult fertility are all reduced by this pollutant. 
the control population is growing rapidly and the pollutant exposed population is shrinking. This leads to a difference in lambda of negative 0.98. And we would want to ask how much of this difference, delta lambda, comes from the lower juvenile survival, lower adult fecundity, lower adult survival, and interactions among those decreases. And to answer that question, we can do a fixed design LTRE. Furthermore, we're going to do a directional analysis using the control population as the baseline in an F ANOVA of lambda. And so I'm going to take a little detour to talk about this directional concept. Because we actually, this is something we we figured out along the way of developing these methods. Um, when we want to ask how a treatment population differs from a control, uh, we have some concept of this response being directional. We we expect the treatment to vary from the control in a particular way. The control is sort of a special population um, in that we've labeled it a control. So in that case, we use the control matrix as our baseline state, and we perform, um, a we call this a directional LTRE. On the other hand, you might have cases where you want to compare two populations, for example, two different lakes, and you do expect there to be differences because there's variation in the world, but you don't have an assumption that one should be like have a special status or be like a basis of comparison. You want to ask why are these two populations different from each other? And in that case, we use the mean matrix as the baseline and we call that analysis symmetric. And we think that this is another reason that exact LTRE can be really valuable because we can more directly match these experimental designs. And while classical LTRE can technically be performed as directional, there's this mathematical argument for recommending that you evaluate sensitivities at the mean matrix, and that makes it a symmetric analysis. We can come back to this and talk about it more, but um, I think it's really important. And um, yeah, so back to our pollutant and control, which is a directional analysis. If we want to calculate the contribution of juvenile survival to the decrease in lambda, we set all the matrix elements to their baseline or control values, and we only allowed the juvenile survival to vary from the baseline. So we essentially build a hypothetical population matrix where the pollutant only affected juvenile survival. We recalculate the difference in lambda, and we find that the contribution of del two delta lambda of the effect of the pollutant on juvenile survival is negative 0.296, or about 30% of the observed difference in lambda. Likewise, for the contribution of adult fertility, we set all matrix elements to their baseline, and we only allow adult fertility to vary. We find that the contribution is negative 0.519, or about 50% of delta lambda. If we wanna ask about the interaction of juvenile survival and adult fertility, we create a hypothetical population where pollution affected both of those parameters. We recalculate the difference in lambda and we get negative 0.672. But here, this is the response of the system and it is not the contribution of that interaction to delta lambda because the contribution, the interaction effect, is the effect above and beyond the effect of each of those contributions on their own. So we need to subtract out the contribution of juvenile survival on its own and the contribution of adult survival on its own, sorry, adult fertility on its own. When we do that, we get a value of positive 0.143. So we find that the contribution of this interaction is positive. It counteracts the negative effects of adult fertility and juvenile survival se separately. So to put this in kind of like a biological story framework, a decrease in adult fertility has a smaller effect when juvenile survival is low to begin with. And putting that in the opposite order, a decrease in juvenile survival has a smaller effect when adult fertility is low to begin with. 
And so this really underscores the importance of these interaction terms. They have biological meaning, they have values, um, they change our interpretation of the population, uh, of what the population experienced. Um, and this two-way interaction term would not be present in a classical fixed design LTRE. So given that I have been making a very forceful argument for why exact LTRE is important and why we should be using it, um, we also want to understand how big of a difference it actually makes. So if we compare classical LTREs and exact LTREs that have been done in the past, um, how important is this for our interpretation? How pressing is it that people use this method? And so to answer that, I did a meta-analysis of errors in the classical LTRE using the Comadre and Compadre databases. After screening and some quality control, I identified 186 LTREs to run on animal models um, from 75 species and nearly 1,500 LTREs to run for plants um, on about 200 species. Uh, for exact LTRE, we've calculated up to three-way interaction terms, plus a single term representing all the four-way and higher interactions. And I'll come back to talk about that a little bit more at the end. Um, but for now, just take me at my word. That's what we did for this meta-analysis. So um, for this meta-analysis, we want a single value representing the error. Uh, and so for that, we define the overall error E as the one norm of the difference between the vector of contributions calculated using exact LTRE and the vector of contributions calculated using classical LTRE, so this C hat. We can also decompose this overall error into the approximation error, which arises from mismatch in the terms that are present in both exact and classical LTRE, and then truncation error, which arises from terms being omitted from classical LTRE that we have calculated in the exact LTRE. So I'm going to show you a few figures. Um, so this is for fixed design LTREs. Animals are on the left, plants on the right, uh, overall error in the first row, approximation error in the middle, and truncation error along the bottom. Um, this error has the same terms as delta lambda. Um, and I also want to note that lambdas tend to be uh, comparable among species, among populations. Um, there's a big cluster of observed values near one, and then um, the delta lambdas are typically going to be less than one. So that'll give you a little bit of a sense of um, what these error, um, like kind of the scaling of this error. So what I want you to notice here is that the um, error values tend to be pretty small. They this this distribution is skewed towards zero. Um, but that there are values way out into these tails where the error is getting quite large. The other thing I'd like you to notice, and here I'm gonna draw your attention to the plant side because there's a bigger sample size um, and these distributions are a little bit easier to see. Um, I want you to notice that the overall error distribution and the truncation error distribution look somewhat similar. While the approximation error is really shifted, it's really concentrated in small values. And so, um, this is underscoring that, or, or this is demonstrating that the truncation errors, the, the, the terms that are missing from the fixed design LTRE in the classical method are really driving these overall errors. This is contrasted with the random design. So here, this figure has the same setup, but now the units on error are in variance of lambda. So they're much smaller values. We still have, um, it's skewed towards zero with some larger values, but now we don't see this pattern of truncation error really driving overall error. We see maybe more, we could argue a bit more for approximation errors and truncation errors contributing more evenly to um, the overall error. And so together, this really underscores how important those two-way interaction terms are, because those two-way interaction terms, they are present in the classical random design LTRE, but they are missing from the classical fixed design LTRE. Another way that you can think about error and that error has been thought about is using relative error. And this 
measure has been useful because it can be calculated only from the results of the classical LTRE. So it has been used in some previous papers um, to check the accuracy of the decomposition. It compares the sum of all those estimated or approximate contributions um, oops, to the actual delta lambda or variance in lambda. So for example, here's the fixed design. This is the sum of all the contribution terms um, minus the true value divided by the true value. And so um, we wanted to ask whether a small r would actually imply that the classical LTRE is close to the exact LTRE, um, i.e. that the overall error that we calculate using the one norm that's a term by term comparison um, would also be small. Um, and what we find is that relative error is not very strongly correlated with overall error. So these figures are log scaled um, and relative error is shown on the x-axis and overall error from our one norm definition is shown on the y-axis. And although in the animal plots, you might be like, oh yeah, there's kind of a pattern there. Um, the R values are quite small. And as we get into these larger sample sizes in the plants, um, we, we see that pop that relationship doesn't really exist. Um, and so there's two major reasons that relative error is not well correlated with overall error. And I'm going to show you two case studies to demonstrate those two sort of mechanisms. The first is that we can get compensation between approximation and truncation errors. That Taylor series approximation sometimes can operate in a way that it kind of shunts the higher order interaction terms into the lower, the, the main effect terms. Um, leading to a relative error that's really small, despite mismatches in the, the true contributions of the different terms. So this is a fixed design LTRE for the sand olive that has a relative error of only 2.2%. So we might assess like this did pretty well. This is the sum of all of the approximate contribution terms compared to the true value of delta lambda. You see they agree quite well. But then as we zoom in on individual interaction orders or individual terms, we see that there's um, a, there's an offset that we might care about a lot more. And in particular, there are these two um, two-way interaction terms that have um, a comparable magnitude as some of the main effects that we're interested in. Um, so they're really forming part of the story and we might care a lot about including them. Um, but because of the way that this compensation plays out, um, this offset here between the approximate contributions and the exact contributions is compensated by the missing higher order terms. The other way that this happens is when there's trade-offs in the actual contributions from matrix elements. So this is a fixed design LTRE for ground squirrels um, that has a relative error of 200%. Um, and you might notice that the this <laughs> axis has really small uh, labels. These are really small numbers. Um, so the the classical method, um, the sum of contributions is very small and negative, while the true uh, delta lambda is quite small but positive. And if I was looking at this, I would be like, I don't know how to assess if this is reliable. If the only information I have is this relative error, I'm not sure what I should conclude from that. And um, what we end up seeing actually is that these sums at the different interaction orders um, and all of the higher order terms are two orders of magnitude smaller than the important um, main effect terms. And these main effect terms are each evaluated quite well by the classical method, but because they trade off against one another, it leads to an apparent um, you know, lack of reliability of these results. And so um, this is another reason that rely the relative error does not tell us if these results are reliable. So to summarize the results of the error meta-analysis, we found that errors can be quite large, um, especially in classical fixed design LTRE. We found that truncation errors dominated in the fixed design LTREs. Um, with, sorry, and the truncation errors dominating is helpful evidence for the importance of those two-way interaction terms in particular.
Um, and finally, that the reliability of classical LTRE cannot be assessed using only the classical LTRE results, both because of compensation between approximation and truncation errors, and because of trade-offs and contributions from matrix elements. Um, I'd like to take just a couple minutes here at the end to give you a bit of advice for how you might choose to use exact LTRE methods in your work. Um, and part of this is a little bit playful so that it will um, maybe stick in your head. So um, I think we'll all agree that it's very important to choose the LTRE analysis that best matches your question. So if you want to understand the difference in lambda between a control and treatment population, why is the Hulk different from Bruce Banner, then you would use a directional fixed design LTRE. If, on the other hand, you want to understand the naturally occurring difference in lambda between two populations, why are the beetles different than the stones, then you would use a symmetric fixed design LTRE. And finally, if you want to understand the variance in vital rates among population and how that drives variance in lambda, then you might be herding cats and you can use a random design LTRE. Um, the last thing here is thinking about the maximum interaction order that you should calculate. If there are M matrix entries that differ among your populations, there will be two-way, three-way, et cetera, all the way up to M-way interaction terms that you could calculate. And that gives you a lot of terms to try to look at and interpret. Um, with seven matrix entries that vary, you'll have 35 four-way interaction terms. And if M is greater than 30, then the vector of terms would actually exceed the maximum object size in R. So we have a hard limit in our package um, on M equals 30. Um, but like, do you really want the 30-way interaction term? What, what does a four-way interaction term mean? What story are you going to build from the seven-way interaction terms? Um, so our advice is to calculate up to the three-way interaction terms and then calculate the final term that's the sum of all higher order contributions, as we did for our meta-analysis. And then you check that that higher order contribution sum is less than 5 to 10% of the observed difference or variance in lambda. It doesn't guarantee that nothing's happening at those higher, um, those higher orders, but it means they might trade off against each other, they might be noisy, and it gives you some confidence that you're describing the bulk of what's going on in your system by, by focusing on the terms that you can actually interpret. Um, and so finally, uh, a last plug for our R package. Um, it's available for download through CRAN. It includes functions for classical LTRE, exact LTRE, um, a few demographic calculations, and then some transferable lower level calculations that you can use to build your own code um, if you're interested in. So right now it only decomposes uh, Lambda, but you could use these lower level functions to build up some code um, to decompose R0 or other summary metrics that might be of interest to you. And um, I'd encourage you to get in touch with me if you want to work on anything like that. Um, we can definitely um, build that into the package if we have uh, some energy uh, to do it. So uh, yeah, I'll stop there and um, I'm excited to discuss. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Chrissy, for that. Fantastic presentation. And then if you have any questions, please raise your hand in the participant list and I will call on you. Uh, yes, Rob, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Chrissy. That was very neat, very well explained. Can, can I just confirm if you can hear me okay? Today's internet has been acting yes. up. In my house. Um, so there's a wealth of treatments within the databases that you have been using, which one could try to make sense out of. You have got hunting, you have got grazing, you have got fires, you have got seeds, limitation experiments. Um, and then at the same time, you, you, you have got a wealth of life histories, which are dominated through different trade-offs. So, I, I, I'm going to ask you a question, but you might very well be working on this already, or maybe that's your sec, your next paper, right? So um, could you come up with expectations as to which kind of treatments and which kind of life histories would be dominated, their differences will be dominated by second order interactions, third order interactions, et cetera, et cetera? 
Right, right. Um, so I am that I am working on uh, that. I've done all this work to identify LTREs that we would want to do in the database. And those are not just to run errors. Um, we also want to ask uh, a bigger question about what uh, what patterns can we find? What drives these things? Um, I hadn't thought about it as much as like in terms of what whether first order terms or second order terms are most important. I was thinking a lot about are there settings or treatments that um, affect fertility more than they affect survival? Mm -hmm. um, can we think about different um, how that in, how the treatments interact with life history wow. and things like that? Um, so I don't know that I have expectations about what would lead to um, first order terms versus second order terms being more important. I think uh, I think that's actually a really neat way of thinking about it, right? Whether there's going to be some some treatments perhaps that may be targeting some vital rates and not others, but perhaps also you can think about it in terms of treatments that might be might be a bit stage agnostic versus treatments that might be targeting specific stages, right? So poaching, yeah. for instance always targets a specific stage, um, either big lions or small lithops, depending on the species that you're working with, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I'd imagine that treatments that are a bit more stage agnostic might be bringing about more second order derivatives. Yeah, yeah, I think that's, yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, very, anyways, just, just a thought, very neat work, by the way, very well done. Thanks. Thanks so much. Uh, any other questions? While people are thinking, maybe I will ask. So uh, one thing is uh, that, is there such a thing as Efankova? So uh, you were talking about uh, uh, a very ANOVA-like, design where you have indicator variables that are either zero or one. Is it meaningful even in this case to go into the continuous variable case? Assume, because those functions can mm. be, I guess, heavily nonlinear. So, so it might not make sense. I haven't thought about this at all, but just is, is that a possibility? Um, I'm hoping Steve can help a little bit. Um with answering this if he's there. Um, so I think like in this case, our features are discrete, right? There did this, did this element of the matrix vary or not? And sorry, to, for for I know so so it, it's not in that, that context, but more say if you have a disturbance gradient and you yeah. measure the uh, you do the experiment along the gradient, something like that. Yeah, Steve. That's yeah. That, that's getting more towards the um, um, the the Sobel indices, where um, you're you're assuming that the input variables come from some probability distributions, and then you're trying to decompose the overall um, variance um, in the response. So. Um, those those things do exist. Um, the they, they 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 crash up against the same problem that you have this multiplicity um, of interaction terms, and then you have to figure out what to do with them. Um, and there are various different ideas um, about um, about what you should do about that. Um, but then in light so, of um, Pardon? Go ahead. Sorry. No. What? No. What? What was your question? Oh, I was just uh, wondering: Is it fair to say that this method is really powerful when you have discrete indicator vari variables? Um, it, it's a little cleaner when you have discrete indicator variables. There's, I think, there's less ambiguity about um, how you how you should define things, um, and uh, but none of them none of them get away from um, the 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 problem that you have a large number of interaction terms and somehow you have to some somehow you have to um, cut it off and figure out what and tell a story about the ones that matter. Um, 
if you think about it, Yergi, if you look at that decomposition into, um, you know, um, baseline plus main effects um, plus second order plus third and fourth order, if you have one such decomposition, you can rearrange it into infinitely many others. Yes. Just by just by shifting things around yes. from one term to another, okay? Um, and so it all depends um, on how on side conditions that um, that specify prop. What does it mean to be a main effect? What does it mean to be really a genuinely second order interaction? Um, once you have continuous variables, so it's not quite so clean as the discrete case. Um, and there are more, there are larger numbers of variants out there for the continuous cases. Um, the um, currently people are shifting towards Shapley values um, from game theory um, as the as the best main effects, but uh, I, I don't know how long that's going to last. <laughs> okay, thanks so much. Yeah. Uh, by the way, in the meantime, if there are any questions, please. Feel free to raise a hand in the chat. Chris, please go ahead. Hi, thank, thanks a lot for the talk. Um, I was just wondering a little bit how the difference between the exact and the approximate, obviously there's an improvement to be made there, but in terms of the uncertainty, how much uncertainty is there in the underlying matrices you're working with? So they kind of obviously, you, you're getting, a, the, the maths is a lot better, but it, how firm are the foundations it's working on in the first place? That is, that's the question that keeps me up at night. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I think you're right. And, and the more time I've spent doing this kind of meta-analysis and synthesis work in these matrix um, databases, the, the more I feel like we have to be really careful about how we interpret stuff because the, if you collected the, there's huge differences in the quality of the data underlying these matrices, right? Some of them are from one year and some of them are from 10 years. And so thinking about how representative of it, how representative is it of a stable population? Is the population gonna keep growing at that rate? And so I think like, yeah, there's tons of uncertainty. There's lots of models I had to reject because the year that they collected that data, they didn't observe any juveniles maturing to adults. And so they have no, like they end up with a reducible model. Um, and, and so you, yeah, anyway, I think there are, um, I think we lost Chris, but I think there are um, issues with some of that underlying data. And um it, that doesn't mean that this comparative approach is useless, right? I think like still asking like what what drives these differences? Um, I don't know. Uh, Rob, do you have any plans to try to think about uncertainty uh, on the vital rates themselves? You know, like I think we don't have that data. People don't report that data. Um, yeah, I don't have a better answer. It's something that bugs me though is like, what can we really conclude um, from a single model? There are some, that's a really good question, Chrissy and and, um, and Chris. And I, I wonder if Sam is in this conversation, Sam Gascoigne, one of my PhD oh. students who's been collaborating with Chrissy. Sam, are you here by any chance? I think he was before, but he might have had to run. Anyways. I don't mean for this to become a game of delegation in answers, but uh, Sam, Sam has been uh, working on the status quo of stage structure demography and, and the data that do get reported and the data do, that do not. And Chrissy, of course, has been involved in that effort as well. And it, it baffles me that um, estimates of variance of vital rates are not typically reported. So if there's no reporting on that, there's really little that we can do other than going and, and asking politely for, for that information. But that in itself, of course, is a titanic effort. Just getting the mean values is, has been a titanic effort. Mm -hmm. I don't yeah. have a better answer than that, I'm afraid. Yeah. This is the future of, of big data demography. It's like putting more of this, you know, having the actual individual level uh, life history data available online as we move towards more and more open science. If you have that 
level of data available, then you can ask about those variances. You can ask if the difference between those populations is statistically significant, which is something I've been playing with in a side project. Um, like you can you can start to work on some of that stuff, but you really you need that individual level data um, to be able to run those numbers. And so I think we're a long way from building that into the, these kinds of comparative methods, but there's definitely value in doing it and, and thinking about the uncertainty um, for sure. If, if I can jump in for, yeah. for a second to talk, answer Chris, I, I think um, the, the example Chrissy did with, about that two-way interaction might be um, relevant because there's a biological story there, right? Um, it has to do with saying something about the way two different vital rates um, interact with each other. And, and that story is probably robust against numerical entries, right, in each of the, of the matrix, right, matrix entries. It's, it's telling you something about how those populations work. Um, that's probably robust against um, anything but enormous estimation errors. Um, and it may be that the, the biggest thing um, from the exact method is that you can get those two-way interaction terms for a fixed design LTRE, um, whereas the classical one doesn't get you those. Yep. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, I think I think that's a really important point. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions? Uh, yes, Megan, please go ahead. Um, yeah, that was a great talk. Um, I was wondering, yeah, I guess, um, following from some of the questions just now, um, is there any repeatability in where you'll find the errors in, like, is it going to be in the juveniles? Are they almost always going to be the hardest to sample? Or, like, could you say anything about the errors based on the size of the organisms in question? Like, is there, and could you project, like, how big of an impact that will have? Oh, that's really interesting. Um, so I, I didn't include it in this talk, but we did try to look at whether there were any features or covariates of the matrices that would drive errors. Um, so is it more likely in populations that have long generation times? Is it more likely um, when lambda is high, when lambda is low, you know, do you see any patterns um, with other features of the life history that we can pull out of those matrices? Um, and the only things that pop out are things that are like, how far apart are the two matrices, which has to do with whether that Taylor expansion like breaks down. But you're asking about uncertainty in the matrix models. Yeah, um, yeah I think that's like, that's really interesting. Um, it probably varies between species. There's lots of species where we're not very good at observing certain stages, and then we um, we fill in those um, those parameters as best we can. There's lots of models I've looked at where they're like, we looked at the adults between these two populations, but we couldn't get enough juveniles to estimate juvenile survival well. So the juvenile survival is the same between both populations or like super common in plant models is that you can't estimate germination rates very well from plots. And so you do those in a separate experiment. Um, and so there are places where I think we have uncertainty in um, or a disconnect between how we collect the data and like whether that actually relates to the treatments you're looking at or the years you're looking at. You know, if you estimate a germination rate across everything, and then you have seed set that varies between years that you can measure in your plots. Like, so I, I think that's like really, that's getting into the specifics of your system. And I think one of the ways that you remedy that is by um, census design. So sometimes they collect more data on some um, age size classes or age classes than others that they can estimate those classes well. Um, for example, if you're gonna have super high mortality among your seedlings, you might need to count more seedlings than you need to count like saplings or something like that. Um, and then the other thing that's super important is choosing your um, your structuring variable well and, and selecting um, how, how to collect that data, right? So if you, and this is 
this is one of the things that I think IPMs can do a bit better. When we're thinking about size classes, we can think about those sizes as a bit more continuous and use the data we collect a bit better in the fitting procedures. To me, that's the big difference between matrix population models and integral projection models is the way that you fit the data um, and that you have a little bit more flexibility in um, or like you can leverage the data you have to fill in gaps um, with better statistical methods. Um, but yeah, so it's, I think that what's really important is choosing what variable is most important and collecting the highest quality data you can. So you don't go out and you say, this is a class one individual. You go out and you say, this individual has this um, diameter stem. And then later, when you know how much data you have, you can then figure out what the appropriate bins are, like how does size drive um, variation in survival, rather than a priori saying, oh, there's going to be four classes of individuals with these bins of sizes. Um, that gets more complicated when you're talking about developmental stages that you can differentiate in the field. Um, but again, you could take, you can, you know, like, okay, so yeah, there are developmental stages. So when you're going out and measuring lizards, you record what developmental stage they are, but you also um, record like snout to vent length. And so you're collecting more of that data along the way and um, trying, and then that will tell you, um, you use your data to drive wh what the classes should be. Is that kind of... Um, yeah, that's a um, that's useful perspective. I guess I was also wondering, like, if there's an independent um, check on the lambdas, and if it's possible to use that to kind of reconstruct what is missing in the matrix. I think about that a lot, and I wish I had an answer to that question. So I'll pose it to you. Yeah, um, that's really hard. I don't. <laughs> I don't know if I have a good answer. So um, on this, in this project, um, these error meta-analysis results, we didn't restrict the lambdas in any way. But in my second project, um, where I'm, I'm doing a different set of analyses, but also in these databases, I've restricted to lambdas that are between 0 0.5 and 1.5. Because stuff outside of that is probably representative of something kind of anomalous, something kind of funky going on, um, experimental results where you have like, if you hit them with like a really nasty pollutant, then you might see the population crashing really fast, but that might not be useful for the kinds of questions I'm asking in that study. So I think like, yeah, you do want to calculate lambda and you want to ask does this lambda seem reasonable for the system I'm working on, right? So I, I have some work where we're using experimental data and the lambda is nearly two and it's a time scale of a day. So we're talking about like this population could double every day, right? That would be ridiculous in a natural population, but it's a laboratory population where they're like in these individual wells and they're really well fed and there's no predators. And like, you know, there's no sources of extrinsic mortality um, and so it, it's reasonable in that system, but so again, it's like, it matters so much, like what species are you talking about? What time scale are you talking about? And, and what, um, what were the conditions where that data was collected? Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Any more questions? If there are no more questions, then thank you all for coming. And thank you, especially Chrissy, for the presentation and the discussion. And uh, we will be in contact with the next seminar, whenever that will be. And uh, we hope to see you, all of you then. So thank you again for coming and see you next time. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.